Well, the vast majority of what we're going to cover in this workshop will focus on instructional planning and design and different options and things like that. I did want to devote a little bit of time to program level features and supports, or let's think of this as systems level features and supports. This may be things that you can do at the school or district level to support your teachers and students and parents. So here we're taking more of a systems view, um, which we know is actually very important for online education. So our goal is really to provide not just online learning or online instruction, but really an online education. So our goal when we develop and deliver effective online is an educational ecosystem. So usually when we start building online, most people start at the course level and think about, oh, I need to design my course. Uh, and then from there, you know, we build out um, more courses and add that and build out a curriculum. So, you know, maybe you've got a bunch of courses as part of your um, curriculum. So now we're kind of thinking and planning at the curricular level. Um, but then around that, we also have this whole educational ecosystem. And if you stop and think about it for a moment, um, the reason this is important is the same reason these things are important for in-person learning too. It's not simply the classes and the collection of classes that make in-person learning effective. It's an entire educational ecosystem to support our learners. The same is true for online. So around this curriculum, may, we may have different sources of support like the library, finances, um, uh, this is more higher ed maybe, uh, maybe access to academic organizations, social events that take place, maybe job and career training and support, access to peers, the ability for learners to collaborate with each other and go, you know, connect with each other to study together or whatever, as well as access to teachers. Um, and so each of these and, and more are really part of an important educational ecosystem. So we want to be thinking about how can we build in those different types of access uh, for our learners. So I'll give you a few examples from some programs um, that we've built. And um, I mean, these are from higher ed, but they're going to be pretty consistent. Um, and I'll, I'll pull up some other examples here in a bit. Um, but for example, um, when we built the online program at the University of Virginia, we plan not just the formal class sessions, but also what are informal learning interactions that we wanted to ensure continued to take place. And what were some co-curricular support structures? So this might be like student clubs or things like that, where we were helping the students continue to get together, but it wasn't a formal class session. Informal learning or interactions are things like how students get together outside of class to study together or work on a project together or something like that. And so we wanted to make sure that we had infrastructure and support in place for that as well. Um, so yeah, they might take a class together and be in there, but how can they connect with each other and share information and ideas and things like that. Um, for program in uh, blind BVI stands for blindness and visual impairment program. So we had a number of students in that and, as, and instructors as well who were um, blind or visually impaired. Uh, but this was a program we built out in 2000 um, to prepare teachers who were going on to teach blind and visually uh, impaired uh, learners as well. Um, to build that, like we um, connected students to the library, to financial aid. We created a virtual student center with discussion boards and chat rooms and time zone clocks because we had students across different time zones and stuff. So you might want to give some thought to how do we wrap a sense of community around our learners um, and provide them some support. Um, and here we used images of the actual buildings or spaces from the campus in order to build all of that out. So distilling this down into what are key features um, of uh, system level or program level components um, that you can uh, integrate into your planning process. Um, this is a summary of 
uh, components in the Appleton E School that was in the um, U.S. Department of Education 2010 report on distance and, and blended learning. And you can see here this list of eight different key components or features. So in addition to having courses and curriculum, which you know we've got um, a program curriculum here, but in addition around that, there's program information and you know the ability to provide updates um, for prospective users, creating an orientation. Um, that's an introduction that prepares students for how to be successful in the online course. With younger learners, of course, you also need an orientation for parents or for caretakers so that they help get, uh, they get oriented to um, the system and what it means to be successful. Of course, you need the technology in place, um, the hardware and the software, um, and then system supports uh, for the teaching personnel who are dedicated to online. Um, and then even mapping out like uh, opportunities for students to practice characteristics that are necessary in an online environment. So uh, we actually created as part of our orientation at UVA, we created something that was a, you know, create your plan for success just to step students through not just how to use things and what it looks like, but what does it mean to be a successful learner and online and here's some practice opportunities and starting to think through, okay, how can you participate in, uh, in an online environment? And then of course, providing system supports like to uh, mentors or parents or coaches or others who are involved. So really making sure you're thinking through who's gonna be impacted by this and who's gonna have a role to play. What is that role and how are you going to support them in that? And then of course, you want a system for collecting data and then uh, a process for using that data in a meaningful way to inform program uh, decision making and maybe share information with other programs. This is just an example of how we scaffolded in new online learners where we provided them an orientation and that orientation um, included a quick start guide that was you know here are all the things that you need to take care of um, that will take you maybe a day or two to work through and um, all the links and contact information for those resources. And then in the orientation we went through, you know, you may not want all of this, but these are the details that we felt were important. Um, we went into some university history and culture because UVA has, you know, its own specific history and culture and terms even that it uses special events. And we wanted our online students to feel every bit as much a part of that history and culture. Um, our, we go into detail about our honor code and as part of that students also have to take a plagiarism tutorial and test that in and we just use one that Indiana University's put together um, but you may want to go into you know what is what is your school's honor code what does that mean um, you know we included some resources and existing videos on that um, and then we provided program details and expectations like what are the classes what are the technical requirements um, this is higher ed, so we provided more details as well on the curriculum and, you know, what students need to know to work their way through that. And then we incorporated this, what I mentioned earlier, this plan your success guide that's based on Watkins and Corey's e-learning companion, a student's guide to online success. I think they provide so many great tips in there. Um, so we have them go through this orientation and as part of that, complete a plagiarism tutorial and test and they have to this generates a certificate at the end, so we have them submit that. And then they complete a coursework job aid because that's what we need them to do is start planning out what courses they're going to take. Um, and then set up a time to meet with their advisor. This could be with their teacher. Then we also host a synchronous or live via Zoom welcome session and orientation before classes start as well. This is an example of the library integration. We work very closely with our library to create a suite of resources that um, could just be integrated right into our online courses. Uh, we use Canvas. I have to say I've used every LMS um, and they all have strengths and weaknesses, but I really tend to prefer Canvas. Um, 
And so they worked with us to create these. Our librarians actually maintain these, but um, it's a little hard to tell from this snippet that I have here, but this is stuff that our librarian created that's actually integrated right into the course shell. So I, as the instructor, I don't have to manage all of that, but I can link to all of that. And it's updated and maintained by the library staff, um, not, not just by me. So this includes like getting to know, getting started with online access to the library, um, how to search for things, using loan services, um, you know, and again, you can adapt all of this as makes most sense for your students and your school, your school level, all of that good stuff. It's another example, just additional details that our librarians created. I happen to think that librarians are some of the best um, collaborators and partners in developing effective online learning. Um, and I think the more that you integrate in like l access to library resources and library supports, um, the more effective it is for online learners. So this is just a quick example where they provided additional stuff on like digital tools to use for note taking, PDF annotation, academic writing, you know, so I think librarians are just a wonderful resource to connect with and, and help you flesh things out. Let's look a little bit more though at institutional supports um, and excellence for administration of online programs. Um, these are the things that administration and leadership can do to really if effectively support quality online learning. So this comes from a performance improvement uh, body of research really looking at what are the different features of a um, workplace uh, organization, in this case we're talking about schools, and um, what are different things that are either barriers to or supports for um, organizational processes and for um, quality performance. And we found over time that this really shakes out into six major categories of um, job or task expectations and clarifications, rewards and incentives, resources or support tools, skills and knowledge, consequences and feedback, and policies. Um, and you'll want to tend to each of these in order to get your system sort of aligned to really support online learning and online teaching. So some examples, and these pages are really set up more as worksheets. So I'm gonna talk through them very quickly and just kind of tick through them. Um, but you can circle back and work through these. So job tasks and expectations um, are really defining, you know, what's expected of members of the system, including employee, like staff support, instructors, administrators. Um, and sometimes, you know, you might hear somebody say, well, that's not part of my job description, um, especially when it comes to online. You know, sometimes you hear somebody say, well, I wasn't hired to teach online. That's not part of my job description. Um, you know, maybe you need to rework job descriptions. Maybe you need to um, hire somebody uh, new for whom it is their job description or whatnot. But um, it might be helpful just to review job tasks and expectations for everybody and go through some clarification and realignment. So I've just provided you some good questions that you can ask to work through that process. Skills and knowledge, here we're focused on the actual knowledge and skills, uh, in particular around online learning. So for example, do your teachers um, know how to teach online? What skills and knowledge do they need? Um, which is, of course, what we're gonna go into the rest of this workshop. Um, uh, what about your staff? What do, what do they need? So I've provided you again some planning questions around this to go into detail and identify what you can do. Resources or support tools. This tends to be a major either um, barrier or source of support. Um, often when we ask people, you know, about like what's missing or what do they need, resources time and again come up. 
So resources or lack thereof can be both physical and abstract. So for example, that could be not having the tools, not having the time, um, and often online teaching is a lot more work and more time uh, focused on grading and feedback and interaction and responding to emails. So just thinking through, okay, how are we going to provide instructors more time? Um, how, where will they do this? Or where can they host live sessions and talk freely with their online students? Um, this is one of the most commonly cited barriers to performance, so it's a really important one to address. So again, some planning questions just to help you get started working through that. This is another one that we see quite a bit of, um, but it's very subtle, it almost operates in the background, but consequences and in particular feedback loops. Um, so uh, teachers and maybe even students may feel that there are negative consequences for teaching online, that some way or somehow they're actually being penalized for doing that. Um, you know, for example, maybe that in higher ed, maybe that extra time won't count for tenure and promotion. Um, or they have to put in all this extra time, but that's just not going to translate into any sort of recognition or anything like that. Um, or they may perceive that there are negative consequences of getting an online degree or taking an online class or something like that. Um, and then also as part of this, like I said, feedback loops. How is information feeding back into the system for ongoing improvement? Is it timely enough? Is it the right type of feedback? Are the right people getting it? Um, are they getting it so that in, in such a way that they know how to act on it? All of that good stuff. So some planning questions to ask here. In particular, in thinking through how you'll communicate information out to students or faculty or administrators I, and, and building a data cycle, I just want to raise a few considerations there around learning analytics and data that you may get from the LMS or your learning management system. Um, there's a lot of debate around ethical concerns uh, to uh, the data that's collected and what, what um, data rights and privacy students may have, or parents, or, or teachers. Um, there may also be additional legal concerns that you need to work through around that. Um, data myopia can be a real problem where you focus on the things that you can easily get data on rather than the problems or questions that are important to address. Um, and then cultural impacts are very important to consider here as well because how you implement learning analytics and use of data and all of that will greatly impact the learning culture, in particular, um, the, the level of trust, the nature of collaboration, things like that. So you wanna very carefully consider different um, potential pitfalls. Um, and then based on that, map out questions you want to answer um, then identify the data that you'll need and how, you're ga how you'll gather it. Instead of just starting with, you know, well, what data is available and, and again, developing that sort of data myopia. And then another thing you can do is create governance structures that includes teachers and students in developing um, both processes and policies around how data is collected, how it's used, and Rewards and incentives uh, means, you know, we can take a highly skilled and knowledgeable educator with a clear job definition that's working in a place with a lot of resources and that person still may not perform optimally because there's no rewards or incentives or they even sense that there are disincentives. And this definitely happens quite a bit around online learning. Um, so you want to make sure that folks don't feel like they're going to be penalized somehow for teaching online. Um, if they are, then that's, you know, you're going to understandably see declines in performance.
policies is yet another. And sometimes these can be so inadvertent and accidental in terms of how they influence performance. Um, so we may have a great vision and invest in the technology and say we want to do something, um, but then we start to bump up against a policy or a set of policies that motivate performance very differently. Um, a very common set of policies that heavily drive performance in higher ed, for example, are tenure and promotion policies. So uh, you want to identify policies that may run contrary to the desired performance or somehow inadvertently disincentivize the desired performance and make modifications as you can through a process of stakeholder involvement. So some planning questions to help think through that. So the elements of institutional excellence include having great governance structures where there's shared decision-making and ongoing review for continuous improvement, having a shared community definition, in particular one that underscores that online students are equal members of your university or community or family or school, Having a very clear vision and mission for online, clearly articulating the rationale for why online and what the strategic value is for the uh, school or district or institution, as well as for the stakeholders. Online learning clearly supports the institutions or the school's uh, mission, values, and strategic plan. Again, getting those policies aligned Existing policies may need to be revised and maybe new policies need to be developed. Sufficiently resourced. Um, so identifying a clear process for uh, identifying the resources and allocating them. And then creating a community of practice around online learning as well. So try to identify opportunities for teachers to get together and share ideas, raise questions, you know, maybe ask about challenges that they're running into and hear from each other. Like, how did they go about solving that? You know, that could be a sandbox. It could be a um, periodic, what we call a brown bag lunch, where you just get together. And while you're having lunch or a hot tea or something, you talk about what's going on and how you can address that. But these are characteristics that we see in instances of uh, online learning and teaching excellence. So again, for creating a community of practice, you could do like a brown bag or brainstorming workshops, bring in guest speakers and special events workshops on common evidence-based practices and tools and design that support that. Let me go back to this. I'm creating all of this in a free and open <laughs> context. So it could be that you wanna take some of what we cover in this workshop and use it directly with teachers. Involvement of grad students uh, or maybe um, teaching assistants to provide support and prepare them as well. You may even want to establish like an advisory committee of teachers, staff, and students, and parents to provide import, uh, input and informed decisions. And then I wanted to link you here to, this is just um, a, the Sandbox Collaborative out of SNHU, Southern New Hampshire University. Um, it's just a very neat idea of how they've gone about that and how they kind of generate new ideas. Two, I want to encourage you to think about how, even though we've been through this period of implementing online learning in the face of COVID, um, and it's been a, an emergency dash that has tired and fatigued everybody, we've run into significant issues that really do need to address, uh, be addressed. Now we want to kind of turn our, turn our attention to really thinking about how do we continue to iterate on our system so that we're building resilience not resistance. And this comes from a, an article that Phil Hill and I wrote together um, in April in response to what we were seeing around responses to COVID-19. 
So really our system goal is not um, stability per se, but resilience, and there's a big difference. There's a great story, you may already know it, of um, the oak and the reed, um, and how uh, the oak uh, thought that the, the reed or the willow was just very flimsy and would just blow all about whenever the slightest wind would come, and, and the oak, you know, was strong and proud and and um, felt like the willow was just too weak and too flexible and then this huge storm comes along and um, breaks the oak uh, to pieces and but afterwards the willow is what's left standing because of that flexibility um, you know so one might suggest we are relearning or reminding ourselves of some ancient wisdom here, but the goal is to be more like the willow or the reed. And how do we build a system that's really flexible and resilient? We can think about educational technology and using face-to-face, -face, online, and blended instruction together to help provide some of this resilience for our educational systems. In terms of resilience, we know that uh, strong resilience means a very rich structure of feedback loops. Um, you know, it's a system that's constantly feeding data back in, trying to improve on things. Um, even better than that are feedback loops that help to rebuild or restore. And even better than that are feedback loops that can learn or create and design and evolve. And so in the face of the pandemic, uh, which I know has been very hard on all of us, both individually and, and together, collectively, um, if we can start to focus on, well, what can we learn? What can we create? What are new opportunities we're seeing? Instead of just simply returning to normal, quote unquote, how can we maybe design and evolve? And that doesn't mean going all the way to online now instead of face-to-face. -face. It means stopping and really thinking about what are ways in which we might leverage online learning in our schools, in our classes, in a more effective manner so that maybe the next time there's another um, natural disaster or something, we've built resilience into our system, not simply by having tools, but by thinking about the problem space a little differently and stopping right now to say, okay, how can we learn from this? How can we create something that's stronger and more robust? What opportunities can we design and how can we evolve as a school, as a district, as a system? Certainly there are limits to resilience. Even the strongest systems have breaking points. Um, but usually loss of resilience is due to loss of a rich structure. So for example, um, when, we, when multiple species are removed from an ecosystem, that uh, geographic or environmental system actually becomes a lot less resilient to catastrophes. By having more a richer infrastructure, um, then we can actually have a more resilient system as well. So I think if we think about our system like an ecological system, where biodiversity provides critical layers of resilience, then for higher ed and, and education, blended and online learning provide a form of diversity that enhances our institutional resilience. So investments in blended and online learning can extend access in normal times and provide institutional flexibility in times of crisis. Some quick references for the research for you. And I thank you very much for listening through this. I hope this has provided you some um, details about how to think about the planning at the systems level. The uh, handout provides you more specific details and ways in which you can work through these different decision points in your planning process.